This is Jonathan Ferguson, the Keeper of Firearms and Artillery at the Royal Armouries Museum in the UK, which houses a collection of thousands of iconic weapons from throughout history. And this week he's taking another look at Insurgency Sandstorm. Bit of gameplay footage there, something that is not well represented is breaching. You don't typically get that, what we've just seen, which is blow out top hinge, blow out bottom hinge, door, door falls out. That's how shotgun breaching is, or one way of doing uh, shotgun breaching. If you like this kind of content, we've got a brand new season of Loadout airing on the channel right now. New episodes will launch every Sunday, and you can already check out our most recent episode all about the pop culture footprint of the P90. And of course, make sure to subscribe for our upcoming episode about how games get the flamethrower wrong too. Right, let's take a look at the weapons of Insurgency Sandstorm. This is a very nice FN FAL. So I have one from the racks here at the Royal Armouries, and it's broadly the type that we are seeing in the footage. Cheap metal, ribbed handguard with built-in bipod, which is actually a gameplay feature in Insurgency, which is really good. Now the version I've chosen here, this is actually a German G1. The German G1 and the Austrian SGG 58, early at least, are very, very close. So I'm not 100% sure which one they're going for here. This one is a, well, what was called at the time, at least in English, a sniper variant. It's really designated marksman. So you'd have a, a low power magnification optical sight, one in a squad or something like that. So you'd have to swap out the top cover with the mount permanently attached. And that's the German equivalent is here. So this mount is always attached to this piece of sheet metal and you change over your pieces of sheet metal, if that makes sense. The reason I'm rabbiting about that is that the game, happily, because a lot of games with FALs in just go straight for a rail top cover. I like the old school iron sight look, and then you can change it in this game, which is very nice. Traditional wooden furniture. I think that one of the only little minor nitpicks I would have with this model is I don't think the pistol grip is quite the right shape. The angle on the back of it's a little acute. It's a bit, Thick. That's the first thing I noticed is the FAL grip is, I suppose, for 1955 to 8. It's pretty comfortable, at least for me. Quite, quite a steep rake to it, quite slim, and that looks like a bit of an old chunk. That, that may be a, a minor issue. Okay, so they're calling this Alpha AK. Now there was a Project Alpha of some sort in Russia, but I believe that was with a, the AK-74 platform. Big chunky rail forend, that changes the profile of the gun pretty drastically. A few different designs use that, and I believe that was a feature of this loose project. So some of my um, vagueness here is to do with American cloners who have, who have loosely recreated the same basic configuration. So new furniture, including rail handguard, some sort of new muzzle device, um, a rail top cover, and an M4 buffer tube type buttstock. So that's been done in a generic sense with AKs, which I think is what this is really representing. And then there's this Project Alpha, which is I think where the name is coming from. Personally, I cannot stand buffer tube buttstocks on AKs, and that includes the first generation AK-12 buttstock that is not actually an M4 type stock. It's not compatible at all with that but it was uh, inspired by and looks awful and they've changed it. This is very much a conventional modern M4 type buttstock with battery storage in it. The rail top cover, there are at least half a dozen different ways to do this. This looks to be mounted off the rear sight pivot, which means you have to remove the, the leaf, the adjustable range aspect of your rear sight, rear sight rather, and pin on this top cover. So to sort of turn it a bit into an AKS 74U style arrangement, and then hopefully lock it in securely enough at the back that your optic doesn't shift to zero as you use the gun, especially when you open the gun and close it again. Okay, so uh, I haven't obviously fought with a 50 BMG rifle, but just just from observation, although although you can control and shoot this thing from the shoulder if you're sufficiently strong and all of that, realistically there's a lot of felt recoil, and when your field of view is so narrow with a, a scope like this, when you pull the trigger, the effect of, between the effect on target of the of the very powerful round and the recoil taking your your crosshairs well off the 
where they were, point of aim. It's almost as if the targets disappeared. And we, <laughs> we see this in this game, depending how far away they are. So when we do see the bullet hit, I'm not sure how projectiles are trapped in the game, but definite one shot does the job, which is what it sh as it should be. A few things more disappointing in a, in a shooter than using a big, powerful anti-material rifle and shoot them and they keep running. Needless to say, that's not something that could happen. So a game that actually does that. And then what it appears is it's balancing that out by giving you just a five round magazine um, and not just forcing you to only load five rounds. The magazine is actually a truncated five round capacity magazine, which does which do exist. Um, I don't think they're issued militarily, but they do exist for Barrett rifles. Slight cheat, I suppose, because if you've got a Barrett, there's no real reason why you wouldn't have a 10 round magazine on it, but giving you just five rounds of super powerful ammunition to, to enable you to have the realistic feeling gameplay, I think is excellent. I'm just, I'm very impressed with the way the, the Barrett's depicted here. The, I don't know what that armor plate on the back of that technical was supposed to be in terms of th thickness and hardness and everything, but Chances are, in uh, reality, uh, probably even a ball 50 BMG round would, would go through without too much trouble. And sure enough, that's what happens. I'm not sure what the bullet's supposed to be here, but straight through and the guy's dropped. So this thing is seriously impressive in terms of power, um, and it ought to be. Okay, this is a bit of a surprise. M1 Garands can't think of a conflict in the last several decades where I can remember seeing the M1 still in use. As a rifle, of course, it's in widespread use in civilian hands. They are going to show up in conflict zones, in theory. Unusual, not implausible. If one of these things was knocking around whichever country this is and someone takes decent care of it, there's no reason why it wouldn't still work. Of course, these things are going to keep going for decades. In terms of the model itself, it's got a little bit of Call of Duty-itis going on with that rear sight. The aperture is very, very large. While I'm in nitpick mode, the it's highly subjective. I'm sure someone could work out how to do this, but pressing in the, the on block clip from the rear like that down ergonomically is rather difficult to have the, the weapon in front of you and to just sort of casually push it in like that, in my experience at least, limited as it is, you want it much closer to you and you want to push straight down into the weapon to overcome that spring and, and lock, the, lock the clip in place. I'm sure someone has done it this way, but with this kind of weapon, bring it, bring it closer in, get yourself over it, get it loaded and then get it back up, would be my take. Interesting. So if it's plausible that M1 rifles would still be knocking around, as we say here in the UK, um, in this theater, I don't think it's very plausible that a relatively pristine M1C sniper variant would be. They're pretty rare. They're, le they're less likely to survive intact with uh, without know, damn it, everything from damage to the conical flash hider to damage to the scope that would render it basically useless and you would just get rid of it. I think if a, an M1C or D had appeared in this kind of environment, someone would long ago have got rid of the scope mount probably and possibly even the flash hider. Idea of course of a, of a conical flash hider like this is to well, hide the flash. Um, it's not breaking up the combustible gases and preventing them from, from reigniting which a flash suppressor does. Uh, this is literally an old school cone on the end of a stick like a, a Bren, and it's just giving you a little bit of extra length to vis vis visibly hide the main brightest bit of the flash. You'll still get a bit of flash. It makes sense on a Second World War vintage sniper rifle where it's really acting more like a designated marksman rifle. It's, it's kind of cool to see it in the game, but um, it's more sniper elite than insurgency sandstorm, I would say. Ah, grease gun. Specifically, at the moment, this type of grease gun. So this is not just a super heavy barrel, but why would it be? This is, of course, a sound suppressor. This distinctive profile, this was developed for the Office of Strategic Services, the OSS, the US counterpart to the Special Operations Executive in the UK. There are all sorts of sneaky-beaky type operations. The one in the game has, for reasons unknown, been given some sort of handguard sleeve thing that is a Picatinny, uh, Picatinny rail with a full grip on it. It's not, it's not great in terms of 
purists like me, but in a modern setting, people, of course, do modify this sort of thing. If they're trying to use it seriously, they're going to try to modernize it. Although the main thing you'd want to want, you'd want to do, I think, on a weapon like this is to get some sort of red dot sight onto it. And that's not been done in the, the image that I've got in front of me. Weirdly, and I'll see if I can see more of this in the gameplay footage, there seems to be half of a canvas wrap around this, around the handguard that's on this bit. <laughs> now, that doesn't seem to make much sense. These these um, lace-up webbing covers for suppressors, which which were a thing, not on ours and I, not on the others that I've seen pictures of and video of. If you have one on there, often with asbestos string underneath them, by the way, so please be careful if you <laughs> happen to come across one. They lace up and they wrap around. So half of one doesn't seem to make much sense. That's what I'm on what I'm getting at. All right, so firing this thing looks good. The model of the gun looks good. That, that nasty seam weld around the receiver halves is is well, well represented. We've even got the slight offset of these uh, rivets on the back here. So they're not actually level with each other. One is offset lower than the other, and that's that's been faithfully represented. The gun works as it should. Rate of fire is good, uh, the way it op is operated. My only criticism, it's very, very minor indeed, and it would depend very much on the individual gun, is this safety slash dust cover here. It's a safety because this tab blocks the bolt from, from moving, so you can't overcome it, like on a AR-15 or an SGG-44, for example. You have to manually open it up. And then you pull the, the large charging handle to the rear, bolt stays to the rear, but the handle flies back forward under spring pressure, which is exactly what we see. I think the, the, the Chris Vector seems to be a bit of a Marmite gun, as in people either love it or hate it. I'm kind of torn on it. It's Technically speaking, the fact that people are trying to innovate, change designs, that basic designs and systems of operation that we've had for the better part of a century is great. Looks very unusual and, and cool, depending on your, your point of view. Whatever else it does, the fact that it's you know, the 45 ACP variant that we see here, very high rate of fire, very controllable. Again, whatever, whatever you, to what extent the V rate or downward recoil system mitigates recoil, which it does, but the extent of that is perhaps arguable. Regardless of that, it's controllable. The the sort of form factor of the gun and the way you're able, able to sort of handle it and keep it on target, it's very high rate of fire for a relatively high recoil cartridge, for, for a pistol cartridge. It's cumulative, um, and we see that with the, the game gun. It's it's pushing back toward the shooter quite drastically, but it's not rising. The muzzle rise is not is not drastic, and that, I think, is a combination of their unusual bolt system. Drops down into that big, thick housing underneath rather than coming straight back. Helps to push the thing down, and the shape of it is conducive to holding it down. So, it, in many ways, it's the 21st century Tommy gun. This is probably the best rendition that I've seen. I can't think of a better one. Certainly better than the sort of compromised version that's in Modern Warfare 2 that's the wrong shape and size and yeah, not as good as this one. All right, the AAC or later Q, Honey Badger always makes me smile because it, of course, brings to mind the animal of the same name, which is exactly the purpose of naming it Honey Badger. Sounds and handles pretty much as you would expect. I um, haven't, haven't shot a Honey Badger, um, have shot a Rattler, the SIG equivalent to this thing, similar sort of size. And the re reporting games versus in real life is very, very hard to sort of quantify because it depends where you are and ammunition that you use and everything like that. But this sounds right. The recoil looks about right as well. So it's going to be pretty controllable, fully automatic in its military application, of course, which is what this is supposed to represent. And it's going to hit pretty hard at close range with that 300 cartridge. But I don't think Sandstorm is modeling sort of Tarkov levels of ammunition types or anything like that. So that would be the way to, to make this even more interesting would be to have different loads for it. You know, subsonic, supersonic, different bullet designs to, to make it effective for what you need it for. But the, the Honey Badger is designed for 300, seems to work well with it. Yeah. 
Right, KS23 shotgun. We've covered this before in a different game, but this is this is really good. I well, I say that we don't have one to compare it. It's essentially it's, it's a, a Soviet era design, massive pump action. It's pretty conventional in uh, mechanical terms, not remarkable in that way, other than just looking like a real unit. <laughs> but um, the, the key thing is the 23 in the name. So uh, 23 millimeter caliber, which equates to, uh, I believe it's just over six gauge. Uh, now in the, the title screen, sorry, the title screen, the uh, weapon screen there, it said four gauge, which would be substantially even more massive, which I don't, I don't believe that's correct. It should be six or, 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 or close to. A bit of, bit of gameplay footage there. Something that is not well represented is breaching. So you might you might have breaching in the sense of you fire shotgun rounds at your uh, virtual door and it disappears or breaks or whatever. You don't typically get that, what we've just seen, which is blow out top hinge, blow out bottom hinge, door, door falls out. You know, that's, that's how shotgun breaching is, or one way of doing. Uh, shotgun breaching the other way of course being to blow the lock but blow a hole through the wood and some of the locker just falls out you know the, you can do that with a shotgun especially a 23 millimeter shotgun <laughs> Right, MG3. I happen to have one of these. Now, this is a, an Iranian MG3, which is perhaps appropriate for the, the loose setting of this game. So, of course, a German design and still in service, uh, certainly on vehicles in the Bundeswehr as well. Iran operates them. We can see the Persian sight markings. Well, possibly can't on the camera, but there are Persian sight markings on the rear sight. Very minor differences other than that. These are MG42s. They, they, they're just MG42s in 7.62 by 51. Uh, I mean, what can I say about this that hasn't been said before? It's a, an absolute beast, and I think that comes across pretty well in the footage. Maybe the recoil isn't enough because the rate of fire, um, anything between 700 and 1500 rounds per minute, depending on the bolt you fit to the gun. Now in actual service, it's I think it's reported to be about 1200 rounds per minute. The figure in front of me here on the screen is a thousand rounds per minute, which is interesting. Now having, I, mean, I haven't, haven't timed it exactly, but our, our own MG42 that has been occasionally been fired um, here runs at about 1200 uh, RPM. W what I'm getting at here is I don't think there is this huge difference in rate of fire in actual operational service between uh, the original MG42 and the MG1, the MG2, the MG3, which are all in 762 by 51. I think that's entirely down to what bolt is, well, it is entirely down to what bolt is fitted. Well, I'm sure pe people who have served in the Bundeswehr uh, can, can confirm or deny, but my impression is this should, this probably is actually running at more like 1200 in the game and 1,000 would be too low, I think. Anyway, splitting hairs because 1,000 1, to 1,200 or even the maximum 1,500 rounds per minute is all insane, quite frankly. I would say they've um, they've given me a cursed gun, but I I know enough about this this the, the Manorath uh, 73 357 Magnum revolver uh, to know that that configuration with a bipod and a scope and I think that is there's a correct bipod and scope as well is in fact a service configuration for this revolver amazingly. So if you don't know the French um, GIGN counter terrorist police uh, military unit. They actually, as well as issuing these as sidearms, they actually use them as a sniper revolver. So <laughs> this is exactly the sort of thing we normally criticize video games for doing. They actually did in real life to, to some effect, certainly in the 1970s and 80s, being able to precisely place a, a pistol bullet could achieve the effect that an that a armed police unit essentially needed to achieve. It's a bit niche, it's a bit unique, <laughs> But uh, I'm certainly not going to criticize them for doing that. So that that revolver in the game is configured in, in that way. <coughs> All right, this is an oddball. At least it is outside China because this is the, the Chinese um, QTS 11. I'm going to have to go away and do further research on designations because although I, I broadly understand the 
Chinese military system of designation, Q meaning essentially gun, uh, and then the other letters denoting exactly what it is, rifle, light machine gun, etc. Et the Pinyin Chinese for QTS-11 is something completely different. So I don't know where the QTS comes in, but that's what it's called. And that's the designation for this complete weapon. Um, but buried inside this gun is a Type 03 or a QBZ-03 5.8 millimeter rifle. That's why the, the caliber type is listed, the cartridge type is listed as 5.8 by 42. That's correct. That's the standard Chinese military cartridge type. But this thing has relatively compactly mounted into it, piggybacking on top a 20 millimeter grenade launcher. And this is that jack of all trades, holy grail that uh, people keep trying to chase, like the American objective infantry combat weapon. So I think the only military force in the world to be using one of these hybrid weapons, grenade launcher and rifle, uh, what they tend to call the kinetic aspect of the weapon system, is China. Very interesting to see it depicted. Whether one would show up in a war zone, I really can't say. And I really can't say how well depicted it is either, because we have no experience with either of the weapons that go to make up this hybrid design. The explosive effect of the grenades should be pretty small and it seems to be. I say that because it's only 20 millimeters, which is really quite small and 40 millimeters seems to be the sweet spot for a, for a relatively small caliber grenade system, which of course is still pretty big. So that increases the bulk, the weight, it gives you problems for any kind of more than one round feed system. So the only advantage to a 20 or 25 mil system would be a magazine feed and this doesn't have it. So anyway, I'm getting into a sort of ill-informed critique of the weapon itself rather than the, the, the gun in the game, but that's because we don't have access to this um, technology for some pretty obvious reasons. Right, the HS product VHS-2, Croatian design. Uh, we're lucky to have an example of a, a VHS K2 here, K2 being the carbine version. I think you can see the difference relative to the, the game depiction. Um, the barrel is visibly shorter. Main reason I mentioned that is that the, the gun in the game is fitted with the under barrel launcher, which uh, we don't have, unfortunately, but it replaces the handguard and gives you a standard 40 millimeter under barrel capability. The gun looks good. Uh, it, it's fitted with the Stanag uh, magazine housing. So this has the, the Croatian original, which takes not G36 magazines. These are similar in design to the G36 magazine, but they are not G36 magazine. It's, it's not unrealistic, but as provided for Croatian armed forces and people that don't mind buying all their magazines again, <laughs> it would look like this. Uh, if this has been procured by whoever for whatever purpose, then it stands to reason they would go for the AR-15 pattern magazines. So that difference is not in any way an, an error. Um, the only other difference I noticed, uh, except that ours is too short because it's a different variant, it are the iron sights. So ours have these funky flip up, back up iron sights built into the rail. I don't know if that's, I don't know why that's not on this gun, but I'm sure that whichever gun they used as reference didn't have it and that's valid too. Don't know the answer to that one. If you'd like to support our work at the Royal Armouries, I think you know the drill by now, but uh, you can check out our website, our various social media um, channels, our own YouTube channel, which is uh, features me as well, if you like that kind of thing. And among other things as well, we have a new series that's launched called Up In Arms, which includes uh, various other types of arms and armor. Uh, but you might see the occasional guest appearance from me as well. Uh, if you do like what I'm doing in particular, um, I, I can offer a brief tease of an event that's happening in March here at the Leeds uh, Museum that will involve me. So more on that, keep an eye on our social media. We'll see you again regardless next time. Thank you very much. <laughs>